Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. So, you know, that kind of highlights leading into the grizzly bear. Is it misunderstood? I don't know. What can they teach us? Plant dispersion aspect. We have that as well. So it's one of the it's one of the only species where it affects pretty much everything, right? Like mm -hmm. plants yeah. and other. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast, and today I have a special guest. Hello, Xander. Hey! Hi, you, your mommy said you were going to do the podcast with me today. Hey. Mm-hmm. Right? You're gonna, you, you know mm -hmm. all about grizzly bears? Mm-hmm. Yeah? What do you know about grizzly bears? Um, they hibernate. They No, they don't. Do they? <laughs> How long do they hibernate for? I don't know. Half the year? Mm-hmm. Half their lives, right? Long time, huh? When it's cold? Do you hibernate? No. You don't hibernate? <laughs> Your mommy wishes <laughs> you'd hibernate sometimes, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no. What else do you know about grizzly bears? Um, they're, they're brown. Yeah. Pretty big, right? Yes. Yeah. Have you seen a grizzly bear? No. No, they don't live in your backyard, huh? No. Not in Florida, no way. No way. They're up north, huh? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. What do grizzly bears like to eat? Uh, meat. They do, huh? What else? Um, you like uh, it, right? Mm-hmm. They eat some berries? Mm-hmm. Do you think a grizzly bear would eat an apple? No. Yeah, they love apples. Are you kidding me? They do. Isn't that crazy? They like apples. Grizzly bears eat lots of things. They like berries, worms. Do you like worms? No. Not to eat, no, huh? In the backyard? Do you go digging? Now, are grizzly bears related to dinosaurs? Because we always talk about you, Xander, and you're our dinosaur expert. So. They're not related to dinosaurs. They're not. No. no, not at all, huh? What's your favorite dinosaur? Um, I don't know. I have all you of the dinosaurs. You like all the dinosaurs? Your mommy tells me all the time that you always teach her all about dinosaurs, so we want you to keep keep learning about dinosaurs, okay? Okay. Now, before you go, can you roar like a bear, like a grizzly bear? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for coming back. We're going to do squirrels soon. I'm promising you. We just mentioned it. We're going to do squirrels very soon, okay? Okay. Okay, Xander. Thank you. Bye-bye. Welcome back to the All Creatures Podcast, Angie. Hello, Chris. <laughs> I love Xander. Xander, I, uh, just in a year or two, Xander's just going to replace you. I'm just going to have him replace you. <laughs> replace me. How about that? Oh, uh, well, well, it'll be all three of us on air. Well, okay, maybe we'll yeah. even add his dad, John, in too, since he's one of our special guests all the time. Every now and then, every now and then. Yes, Chris, I'm definitely a proud mama bear of my little cub. Or to speak a little more scientifically, I'm a proud mama sow, right? True. Because yeah, true. female bears are sows, which I thought yes. that was very interesting, learning about yeah. that. Males are boars and babies are still cubs. Yeah, they're still cubs, and they're so cute. They're so cute. So the grizzly bear this week, we we kind of hinted at it the last couple of weeks. We have a huge interview on Thursday, so that's what's prompting this, and that's with author Bryce Andrews. It just was such a treat. What I mean, it's just when you get these these interviews, it's just so interesting to get different perspectives. He wrote the book Down from the Mountain, The Life and Death of a Grizzly Bear, and this has been in the works for a while. Just this book and, and, you know, listen to the interview on Thursday. It really goes into the human wildlife conflict. And what I loved about it, I mean, the story's tragic, so I don't love it. But what I really enjoyed about the book is it brought it home to here in the United States because we always think it's a, it's someone else's problem when no, it, it, it's in California where I'm at. It's a problem. Coyotes and cougars and where you are in Florida. Oh, Florida you know? black bear, Florida yeah. cougar, mm -hmm. snakes. 
snakes, turtles, alligators, human wildlife conflict. So, so it is everywhere. And it's just, the book is just so well written. I read it in two nights, just a really insightful interview. And, and I hope you enjoy it. Now, just some housekeeping before we get rolling on grizzly bears, because we have a lot to cover tonight, just a fun species to talk about. Again, for last week, we talked about our Patreon. Angie and I are really serious about it now. We kind of really launched it last week. We put out our first episode, Cheetah. So if you are interested to learn more about cheetahs, it's the episodes are just as well done as this one. You know, it's this, it's the same content, just a different species. So thank you, Katie, Debbie, Alicia, Maureen, John. Angie's going to throw some money in there. My mom. <laughs> Your mom. So, you know, those are some of just our latest Patreon subscribers. And, you know, thank you uh, for helping us out. Angie and I are going to record conservation news here this week. I've just been watching Our Planet on Netflix. I have a lot to say about that, yeah, especially the whole thing with the walrus controversy, which isn't a controversy. Anyways. And then just again, 25% of all funds will be given to a conservation organization of the month. So other podcasts do not do that. We are definitely doing that. We want to give back. Then just really quickly, if you can continue to keep sharing this stuff, our, our content on Facebook, on Instagram, All Creatures Podcast, we love you. And if you haven't given us a review on iTunes, if you can just take two minutes, log into your iTunes account, leave us a review. That's really going to help well, us only, push us only into good the top reviews. 100. <laughs> yes, please. Please. If you don't like us, just turn it off. But we're inching towards the top 100 of all science podcasts, and those reviews help push us there. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's just so amazing. And we're going to talk about grizzly bears today. Going Absolutely. back. It's, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a great pod. Hopefully you'll learn a lot, uh, especially for our listeners in North America too, a lot of times we, even in the podcast, we turn overseas and talk about the big five in Africa, mm -hmm. or we've recently did a huge promotion on tiger conservation and awareness. And of course, physiology, uh, the last month or so, but it's very interesting for me to turn our attentions back to grizzlies, which are among the largest living carnivores here in the United States or in, in Canada, mm. North America. Yeah. And it was interesting. I was talking with John about how we're trying to potentially years from now save our pennies and maybe plan a dream trip to Africa and take our mm -hmm. children so they can see these things. And I looked at him and I'm like, I have never even been to Yellowstone. Yeah, I know. I know. I I've know. been to Glacier National and saw a black bear, but I've never seen any grizzlies which are also known as a North American brown bear. And we'll, and we'll touch more on the different subspecies of brown bears uh, throughout the pod. But yeah, Chris, I, I mean, I think I, I, we need a road trip, buddy. We absolutely do. And I just last week, you know, I was near you in, when I was in Atlanta and I was meeting with some of my sister's coworkers and I was talking to Tom and he grew up in Alaska and he was talking about Denali and the Denali National Park and how I need to go up there because we were talking about the podcast and things that he was doing in in the movie industry and and he's like you need to get up to Denali and I and Tom's kind of a big wig I'm just going to leave his name as Tom but I'm like <laughs> okay Tom you know you get me a movie or a TV show we'll go together and he's like deal <laughs> you know, so we'll go to Denali National Park me and Angie John and both our families uh, to go up there and visit, but he's like, you, the bears are everywhere. You know, you can just right. see them, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. grizzly bears. They are an iconic species, you know, and, and, and it, there's going to be some interesting facts. I think I'm going to, I have a fact that I think is going to blow you away when I get there. We'll see. I'll see your Ooh. reaction. It's, 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 okay. It, it's a good one. It's a good one. So going back to bears, our last episode, Angie, was 80, roughly 79 episodes ago, official episodes. It was episode nine, polar bears. So that's the last, uh, bear that we covered that's a true bear and that's what john would say now a few episodes ago we covered john's favorite little cuddly black and white not really a true bear panda, bear. panda bears so you know here we go another bear this one close to home for some of us now some people might be confused what's the difference between a brown bear or a grizzly bear right you know because mm -hmm. i growing up i used to always think about i was that. yeah yeah it's basically grizzlies are just a subspecies of brown bear. So they are a brown bear. They're just a subspecies. 
And going back, oh, geez, two pods ago or three pods ago, we talked about the debate in science, species versus tigers, really. Species versus subspecies. Why is there debate in science? And DNA is really remapping a lot of this. So today, you know, with genetic testing, generally recognize that there's 15 subspecies of brown bear and grizzly bear is one of those. Now, in North America, there are two species of brown bear, and that is the grizzly bear, what we think of, and then the Kodiak bear on Kodiak Island off Alaska, okay? And they got isolated thousands of years ago. Now, those are the massive, massive brown bears. Just based on diet and where they live, they get very big. But you have brown bears all over the world, Angie, all over the world, Northern Hemisphere. It's all across Asia. Parts of Europe, Scandinavia, Turkey. China, Japan, yeah. Korea. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Chris, according to the IUCN, there are about 110,000 mature individuals of brown bears in 44 different locations. So we're focusing today on the grizzly, North America, but numerous other locations in Asia and mm -hmm. Europe. But I think what's really important to highlight is that brown bear numbers have dropped dramatically mm -hmm. since the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. And basically, they're down to 2% of their former range right. here in North America. Yeah. it's Yeah, they've taken a massive hit, massive hit and due, due to human. But yes, due to logging, mining, road constructions, resorts, golf courses, you name it. Uh, we've encroached on their habitat. And of course, as Chris mentioned earlier in the pod, then there's a human wildlife conflict. And, and basically grizzly numbers are estimated to be around a thousand to 1500 in the United mm -hmm. States. And then when you add in Canada and Alaska, we're talking somewhere maybe around 25,000 to 30,000 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are numbers that I was reading. So the rest are all in Eurasia, right, if you right. will. Uh, they think maybe estimates are about 70 to 100,000. Right. So and that's across just, the Northern Hemisphere. That's, 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 yes, that's, that's the whole yes, world. That's yes. the whole. That's all of it. 44 locations. I mean, that's what, how I kind of had mm -hmm. to map it out in my brain is like, okay, 44 locations total. Mm -hmm. And then only 110,000. Right. That's not very many no, at all. No, and I'm I'm going to tell you, you once I get to evolution where where there used to be, you'll you'll be blown away. They definitely have suffered uh, greatly in the last hundred years as a predator species. Like most of our mega carnivores, I think have all suffered tremendously, and bears are just really the most recent because the expansion into North America has only happened really in the last couple hundred years. You know, this wasn't, we're not talking, you know, American Indians or native, Amer native Americans that came over thousands and thousands of years ago. They lived with nature. You know, these are the ones when the Europeans came in and just started devastating the landscape. And then you want to stay tuned because at the end of today's pod, I'm going to talk about what you should do if you ever encounter a grizzly or, or any bear for that matter in the wild. Well, and Chris, to add to that, I think one of the common things to think with our fight or flight is to run. So no. <laughs> Chris and I will go over if that's a no. good strategy no. or not. No. Uh, can you outrun? No. Like, even if you're Usain no. Bolt, can you no. outrun a bear? No, no. I'll just say. Oh, you're, I'll just, you're giving away the answer. No, there's other things Maybe. you can we'll do at the end, but no. Do not. I just anybody listening right now, do not run from a bear. They will catch you it, before you can blink. <laughs> they're on top of you. They are so fast <laughs> or climb a so tree. quick. Yeah. But yeah, stick with us. I, yeah, I want to bust some bear myths besides their speed and climbing ability. I have several other bear myths that I'd like to bust that as Chris mentioned, may help you survive. Should you find yes, one? Yes. 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 And, and, and I got some statistics too, you know, are they more dangerous than cows? How about that? We've established 20 something people in the United States each year are killed by cows. No joke. That is a fact. So are bears more deadly? We'll find out. All right. Before we jump into description, Angie, and kind of in the, in the physical and the behavior reproduction, I really, each week, I want to start just kind of highlighting some of this. You know, what is really the conflict? What is really, because we, you and I go back and forth. We talk about climate change. We talk about all these different issues facing all these different species. I mean, 
You kind of talk about it. I sit back <laughs> you, and sip on my coffee. You, you jump in every time. <laughs> every time no, you I jump do, in. I do. So, you know, this human wildlife conflict, and I think that's why Bryce Andrews' book is just amazing because it's told so well and you see it. Like I, I physically felt like I was walking in his footsteps in that book, reading his story and how he was trying to help uh, reduce this human wildlife conflict. So again, it's not someone else's problem. It's our problem. I see it here in California. We have coyotes running in the herb, urban areas you know, taking pets and people are upset and they're like, can't we kill the coyotes? Can we get rid of them? And city councilors are like, no, you know, so we see this, you know, wherever we live in the world. So some of the things that are really putting pressure on wildlife, we've talked about poaching, you know, self-defense. Okay. Somebody, it's either me or the animal. I, I get that. Right. But again, that's, right. that's a conflict. Uh, retaliation common throughout the world is going on here in the United States. For killing a predator kills livestock, well, the farmer goes out and shoots the predator. You know, we see it with wolves, we see it with bears, cougars, other things. Or you go to other parts of the world, my favorite elephants, they go raid crops. And there's conflict there. And the farmers are losing their their livelihood or their what they need to live. It's not just, you know, oh, making money, which we see here in the States. Angie, that's your garden. That's what your family depends on, right? <laughs> Right. Yeah. I think that's where I think you brought up a good point about putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, like to, you know, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes to really understand how intense and complicated this conflict is. It is. It really is. Because it's one thing to just sit in your comfy suburban home and be like, oh, okay, I won't let my cat fluffy out because mm -hmm. there's coyotes. Coyotes, yeah. And, and that's, that's a real issue. And, and, uh, we keep our cats indoors mm -hmm. for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the most part, except for bear bear sometimes. She's naughty. <laughs> She's a bear. <laughs> There's always that one yeah, cat. No. Uh, but I think she could hold her own against a coyote yeah, anyways. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but it's a totally different story to have, um, money on the line. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be what's a big issue here in the United States, livestock money, not people generating income and, then overseas, it's not only income, it is survival, livelihood of like, yeah. will I eat tonight yeah. or won't I? Yeah, survival. So that's, yeah, I mean, that, uh, that is why this is a complex issue. And it's, and that's the thing why I think if people can start getting a global view of what's going on out there and see all these pressures, that's why there is no silver bullet to conservation. I really wish there was. You know, but you add this to climate change or deforestation or, you know, palm oil exploitation or, you know, stealing animals, not only poaching, but stealing animals as pets. You know, there's, there's just multiple pressures on multiple species. And one of the things just, if you didn't catch it in tigers part two towards the end, because if you couldn't take two hours plus of tigers, which I don't know why <laughs> they're pretty amazing. Yeah. And if you haven't, you should do it. Yeah. Their behavior is amazing. Yeah. And we talk about the ec ecological benefits. Sci this is a scientific study that's published. So science means it's been peer reviewed. We're going to talk about that in a future pod, you know, what exactly that means. But it's, it, when you have scientific data, you know, equaling facts and you evidence, how about that evidence towards a conclusion? So in this paper, they were talking about the benefits of tigers. And not only protecting livestock losses or reducing it, but also crop losses. So in India, they're finding that having tigers in the environment actually benefits the farmers rather than not. Then the other thing we talked about, which we have to, and one of our friends, uh, Julie uh, B. from Florida, she posted on Facebook about she really wants us to discuss more the benefits of wolves in Yellowstone, right? And we've we've talked about that. And how the environment, the, the habitat was affected by the loss of predators. And then when they brought them back in, how it changed the landscape. So changed everything yeah. from the streams to the, it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Other populations of animals boomed. So there's a lot of complex issues. These are things we're going to be talking about briefly each week in a species. We'll talk more in conservation news and in other aspects on Instagram, things like that, and on Facebook. So you join our Facebook group. We're starting to have discussions there, not just our page, but our group where you can chime in. 
I will say before we move on, countries like Nepal are leading the way in protecting native wildlife. And I really want to investigate more of this and highlight more of their programs, and we will. Sounds like a field trip. Yeah, I know. Oh, God, that's one. I would, I would love, love to, to love go to there. Go, one yeah. of my best friends, Cassie, studied abroad there oh. and just fell in love, and it's been on my bucket list ever since. But news coming out of Nepal is the locals have bought into the message they're protecting their, sure. their native wildlife. And so snow leopards are going up. Tigers are going up. They have elephants. Other things are are all improving because the populace has bought into this and they're seeing benefits. So we're going to talk more about that as we go. So, you know, that kind of highlights leading into the grizzly bear. Is it misunderstood? I don't know. You know, we're going to talk about it. But what a grizzly bear looks like, you know, it's a big bear. It's dark brown to light tan. I love this description. They're guard hairs. So that, that those guard hairs give them that grizzled appearance, right? That's kind of what alludes to their name. Yeah, yeah. Also, it's also thought, too, that maybe grizzly means fear-inspiring or gruesome mm-hmm. as well. And definitely their scientific name reflects yes. <laughs> their <We'll get> there. <laughs> awe-inspiring yes, nature. <laughs> yes, and fear. I think it's fear, you know, which... Ugh. Fear makes people do stupid things. But when you look at a grizzly, they are awe-inspiring. Big, we'll talk about their size in a second, but they also have this pronounced hump that appears on their Mm -hmm, shoulders. mm -hmm. And the hump is a really good way to distinguish a grizzly bear from a black bear. Yes. As black bears don't have this hump. Obviously, they're probably black as well. Um, But there is, real quick, there is like, it's weird because there are black bears that are kind of a lighter brown. So yes, it's like, yes. it's crazy. So I think you make a great point to tell the difference is the humps, the real big one, right? That's the big, I mean, mm-hmm. there's differences and, in face and things like that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a, a grizzly bear is also identified by it's like dished in profile mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, with a shorter face. And of course, bears have those cute, super ears. cute rounded ears Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where a black bear has more of a straighter face very much and longer ears. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then a grizzly bear also can be identified by their rump. And for non-animal people, that's their hind end, <laughs> which is lower, like at the hip area, uh, lower than its shoulders. So it sinks down. It's down lower. Where in a black bear, the bear's rump is higher up. And of course, a grizzly bear can always be distinguished by their long front claws. Oh, my God, Angie. They're and when huge. I say long. They're huge. Like. Everyone now, unless you're driving, hold up your hand and look at your fingers. And that length plus then some yeah. are the claws. Just the claws. The like nail part. Yeah, non-retractable <laughs> claws. I and, and I and I briefly four inches. Yeah, four inches. Four inches. I or ten centimeters. And I talked to Bryce about this really quickly when I was, you know, at a accredited zoo and standing across in the in the back part of the exhibit where one of the grizzlies was standing right there and literally probably two, three feet away, you know, and, and I had bars that she couldn't reach through, but she was just looking at me drooling. And those claws are what I just was like, Oh my gosh. And talk about fear. Like I was like, Whoa, what you could do to me, <laughs> those claws. Now I love them. They're, they're cuddly. You know, you want to cuddle with them, but don't, I'm just saying, you know, I was respectful staring at her being that close to a grizzly bear. I was like, whoa, whoa. I think her name was Dakota. So um, now the males can get up to eight feet tall or two and a half meters, weigh up to 800 pounds. It's like kind of the bigger yes. end. You saw some averages a little bit less, you know, 350 mm-hmm. kilograms. I saw females four to 500 pounds, 200 kilograms, and they stand about six and a half feet tall, about my height. Uh, two meters. Well, that's what's really impressive is a lot of the video fit- footage I've been reviewing the past couple of days is their impressive walking and mm-hmm. sauntering and all that. The, uh, their activity we'll talk to about when we get to behavior. But when they stand up oh, yeah. on their hind legs to smell whatever they're doing, to mark their yeah. territory, their claws, or so- whatever they're doing, mm-hmm. that is intensive very, and impressive very. and awe-inspiring and definitely makes the hair on the back of your neck yeah, stand up yeah for they're, sure they're definitely intimidating they're definitely intimidating and i'm typically not from bear country being originally from michigan and then now being uh residing in florida 
We do have black bear and some of the central Florida regions and there's smaller. Uh, I still wouldn't want to come across one, no. especially a mother with cubs, mm -hmm. but I learned a lot hiking back at Glacier National with some of my, with some of my friends that were rangers there and gave me lots of ways to help protect myself mm -hmm. as I was hiking. Mm -hmm. And, but I just never really, I think I was young. I think when mm -hmm. you're in your twenties, you're just, Bless Whatever. All your 20 year olds yeah. out there. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> information goes in and you just think you're so cool or whatever. Yeah. And it just is like, okay. And so, but we did, we, we were, we were singing mm -hmm. bear songs and mm -hmm. talking the whole time. And wow, I think we had walking sticks or we banging on things. We were being loud and obnoxious. So they would stay away from us, which I think most bears probably would stay away from they a group do. of young 20 year olds. They do. They do. They do. They, they do. That's the thing. And we'll get to it. We get to conflicts, but yeah, you're right. They, they, they don't want to be near us generally. Now, yeah, if they're, they're but, starving or something like that, then that's a different story. But yeah, but I, I just don't have the experience that probably say some of our friends that are in Alaska or Jonathan, Columbia. shout out to Jonathan, exactly. Jonathan's just, back from British Columbia. So he's probably got some good bear stories. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, I just, I, I don't have, I don't, yeah, I, it's just very new to me. And I always think of these large large carnivores is being far off in a distant place like Africa. But yeah, we could go to Yellowstone and potentially see somewhere with your friend, Tom, uh, and Denali and yeah. see some. Yeah. So it is, they're not, and they're not personally in my backyard, but it does make me want to perhaps maybe learn more about my Florida, my local Florida black bear mm -hmm. uh, from a distance, right? That's the right. thing with wildlife. You always, whether it's a large carnivore or even a sm something small, you want to, give it it's the respect it deserves and stay, yes. look at it from a di view it from a distance very much so but yeah very just much. man those those grizzlies on the youtube videos or the national geographic videos i was watching standing up we'll put some on our show notes for you to check out impressive yeah yeah i mean and, Breath and he, literally breathtaking yeah. like you see that and you stop breathing for a second <laughs> no and so like the kodiak bears can get up to you know a ton as ten, stand 10 feet tall and there have been grizzly bears that big that have been close to that, but generally not as huge. But even when you take the average grizzly bear, they're huge. 800 pounds is nothing to sneeze at. That is a massive oh, gosh, animal. No. That is all muscle, right? Now, looking at the range, Angie, this is, again, and how you kind of let off a little bit talking about the decimation of bear populations. You look at their historic range, and then you look at their current range, and it really breaks your heart. These are animals that stretch down into Mexico. My home state of California, the grizzly bear, the California grizzly bear is on our flag. And that last bear sighted in California, grizzly bear was 1920s. So they've been gone for a hundred years. They, you know, they were pushed out of Texas by 1890, all the way up through the Rockies to where today in the United States, you have a small population creeping into Washington state. Most of them are in Montana, some in Idaho. So shout out to Corbin up there, you know, uh, has grizzlies in his home state. And then, like you said, Yellowstone. So you have some of those in Wyoming into Montana. That's where they are in the United States. Now through Western Canada, Northern parts of Canada, they're there. And then obviously all throughout Alaska. But this was a bear that pretty much dominated the western half of the United States up until, you know, 50 to 100 years ago. And now they've been sure. completely eradicated, you know, wiped out. And and it's crazy, too, because when we talk about ranges, historically, their home ranges can be as large as 2,600 square kilometers. But on average, they're anywhere from 100 to 400. And of course, males are going to have bigger home ranges than females. Mm -hmm. But that's a lot of land. And when we think about the human wildlife or human bear conflict, as you mentioned, is since they do need a lot of square footage to to roam and be bears, be happy bears, do what bears need to do, uh, pretty much eat and breed mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. hibernate, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we need to protect them. They They need a lot of room. And that's what the problem is, is unfortunately us people, we need a lot of room too. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we keep building and 
building further, further and deeper into the woods. Well, when you look at, we bump, that's when we bump into them and then we blame them that they're the problem, right? I know, I know. And you know, even the brown bear range, you know, across the world has been decimated. They used to be all throughout Europe, somewhere else special I'm going to tell you about and reaching down into India, you know, that far south, Mm -hmm. but now they're pushed into, there's pockets in the, in, South, you know, middle, not the Middle East. Yeah, the Middle East area, I guess. And then, you know, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, those areas. But mostly, most of them are up in Russia, you know, and then up into Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So their, their range has been decimated too. And why you should care. I mean, again, you know, we're telling the same story with these apex predators. You know, and even it was funny with Xander in the opening. He's like, what do they eat? He's like, ah, meat. And it's true. They do eat meat, which is important. Oh, stay tuned, though. There's some interesting stuff they eat coming up. I know. I know. But, you know, it's they do help keep other populations in check, killing sick or injured. Wait, he didn't answer that they're omnivores. He knows better. He does. I know. He he knows. He was excited. He was excited. He's excited to be on video (laughs) and talk. Uh, yeah, that kid's you know, that's, what I've re- that's what I've realized. I think we, when he's uh, interviewing, he he just likes to look at himself in the video. Yeah, I know, I know. He doesn't, he doesn't get a lot of screen time. So he sees himself talking, and you, of course, you're yeah. fun to look at. And yeah. so he's just kind of messing. So like, I think maybe next time I'll, I'll take that down, and then he can really focus. But, yeah. <laughs> well, he's so but, cute. Know, I, learned, I learned before the episode. And speaking of Xander, too, he told me something really fascinating that I didn't even know that he learned no in one of his, probably in Wild Kratts. Gosh, I love that mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. If you have little kids, it's pretty great. Um, but he told me that there is an animal that a grizzly will run from. Oh, okay. Just, mm-hmm. So okay. we'll cover that when we get to behavior. And, Maybe a, and then I was like, no I'm way. Per- and then, of course, John was like, yep, he's right. I mean, John knows everything. So okay, John is my Google when it comes to animals. <laughs> I love how John chimes and in. And pronouncing the words room. clearly. Yeah, what was it last week or a few weeks ago? <laughs> cockaphony. Yeah, I can't it remember that one. But it's not cockaphony. It's no. cacophony. Ca- 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 <laughs> <laughs> Edit this out. Edit this no. out. No, it's cockaphony. It's, it's no, lame. it's totally not. It's totally not. I, I know. Gosh, I don't, clearly I didn't even remember. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it, it, don't, just yeah. like just like Angie when I was twenty, the forty year old Angie. <laughs> Things go in one ear and out the other when John tells them to me. People tell us on social media what the heck it is because we obviously can't pronounce it. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so they're great. Bears are great. That's why Bears are great. And <laughs> no, a podcast. There we go. Yeah, so, no, yeah, so what are some of the other things? Uh, yeah, what are some of the they other things? They are, okay, well, they're, we just talked about how the, Xander should have said they're omnivores. They're, they eat meat, but, uh, they are also, eat, known to eat berries and nuts and things like that. So they're an important apex predator, but they're also really important seed disperser in local mm-hmm. ecosystems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's just something that people probably wouldn't think of. I mean, if we wipe them out, we're going to have issues from the prey predator aspect, but then from a p- seed and plant dispersion aspect, we have that as well. So it's one of the, it's one of the only species where it affects pretty much everything, right? Like mm-hmm. plants yeah. and other animals. So total, we're talking about total ecosystem cacophony. Yeah. <laughs> cacophony. I think I said it right. Maybe not. So, <laughs> but the other thing too is here, here locally in the U.S., brown bears help fuel ecotourism, especially in Yellowstone National Park, Wyoming, and other parts of Alaska. And fun fact, as you mentioned, they obviously are on California state flag, although they're extinct from California, but they have been beloved by, of course, Native American cultures, historically very sim- uh, symbolic. But interestingly enough, an explorer named Zebulon Pike decided to gift President Thomas Jefferson two grizzly mm-hmm. cubs in 1807, probably because they're cute and adorable yeah. when they're that little. And Jefferson, so the story goes, reluctantly kept them in a cage near the entrance to the White House. But then he later re-gifted them, when they were still cubs even, to a museum curator. So, and I guess, and then, so the story goes, unfortunately, one of them was aggressive and ended up 
being killed and I don't know what happened yeah. to the other one. So yeah. Yeah. obviously not a good pet choice. Um, no, and no. our, one of our forefathers realized that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and even, you know, the, in the zoo episode we did with Corbin Maxey talking about the evolution of zoos. I mean, back then, you know, in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, people loved animals and really thought that we had a moral obligation to treat them nicely. Sure. You know, so it wasn't just, oh, they're in a cage and we poke them, which, you know, that's how people view it. But they, you know, I'm sure he, he had some moral, moral obligation or moral objection sure. to keeping them in cages outside the White House. And he's like, what the heck? This is not natural. So, yeah, it's, yeah, lovely animals that are uh, really misunderstood. Jumping quickly to evolution. I mean, we've covered this in two bear species, so I don't need to rehash a lot of it. You know, 15 s subspecies. But you can't right now. control yourself. <laughs> I know. Funny. Here we go. <laughs> Three hours later. And kids, that's how the, oh, the grizzly bear came to be. No. So, you know, just kind of a, a quick review. Uh, the 15 subspecies of brown bear are, and brown bear's scientific name is Ursus arctos. And these, again, range from North America into Asia. And here's my fun fact, Angie. Yay. I put my seatbelt on. Did you know there was a brown bear? It's called the Atlas Brown Bear. So I'm going to pick your brain and say, where is that? Where's the Atlas Mountain Range? I know. I can see it in your face. I got you stumped. How about this? I I love Jeopardy right now. There's this, this uh, Jeopardy guy that's I like winning $10 million. He is years. winning. And, and I just, I had a moment uh, a day or so ago and I was like, man, I miss my dad. I miss him every day anyways. Yeah, yeah. But he was so good at Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. He would just be reading the newspaper, cooking dinner and just yell out the answer. As I'm sitting there <laughs> trying to watch it and actually get the answer right. He'd half listen and just and get it. And so with this Jeopardy, he'd be disappointed in me because Atlas, I, I thought maybe like, okay. I thought, no, no, I, I, if I had to guess, I thought maybe like Iran or Greece no. were kind of coming. Oh, no, 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 no. Not even close. Okay. Jeez. Let me Sorry, give you, Dad. let me give you hints. It is, Sorry, folks. This is just me having fun with Angie. It, yes, these are I rare like moments. Okay. Nubian, Somali, Atlas. Africa. Wild asses. Where was the Atlas Wild Ass from? Morocco. Uh, Ethiopia? Morocco? No, Morocco. Remember, Morocco. you had the Atlas Wild Ass in that no, region of Africa, that. the Nubian Wild Ass in the middle, and the Somali That's, on the... Somali okay, those were the, Ethiopia, yeah. Right. Those okay. were the three wild asses. There was an Atlas brown bear. There was brown bears in Africa. What? The, there is a I crazy fact. Jeez, I know, but there, it, it was in Libya and Morocco... And they only, so the Atlas wild ass went extinct in the 1350s. Yeah, I don't, this one I don't extinct, remember that, but, that one. I remember the Nubian no. and the, um, yeah. and the Somali, Somali. of course. Hmm. Okay. So went extinct in 1890s. That's so, so just cool, 130 though. years ago, there was brown bears in Africa. That's like, nuts. Oh, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's, huh. yeah, that's insane. That's insane that they were there. Great fact, I, I, Chris. That you, yeah. you get a star of the day for that fact. Yeah. Okay. You've been We're making done. me look like a fool on on air. <laughs> I'm totally worth it. Like fool. I didn't no. know that. I know where the Atlas Mountains are because I'm a geography. Oh, nerd, sure, but... sure, sure. If it was, oh, on Je I've... well, we'll have to play Jeopardy one on one. Right. Uh, yeah, I have okay. I have a couple categories I can rock. Not oh, you would kill me on <laughs> yeah, many. All right, geography. No, I know my geography because I, yeah, I go to Google Earth. I, I, well, you're the history buff guy, which is why uh, too, we love yeah. evolution, or you love evolution so much, um, and I like it too. We actually had a. Yeah discussion over dinner about evolution trying to explain that to a uh, five-year-old five and third and two-year-old <laughs> well zach was out he was like whatever okay. i'm out of no. here i'm going to play legos <laughs> yeah. okay and xander's like okay oh he's like a million questions a million yeah questions. he's so great i love your kids okay so the scientific name is of grizzly bears of the subs so subspecies of brown bear ursus arctos horribilis Yes. Horrible. Like, come yes. on. That I sucks. Know. That's, that's a terrible what the, name. I mean, that's what the explorers, I guess they saw it and it's probably stood up on its hind feet and they jotted that down, right? Yeah. I would call it cutest or stay away from us is or something. Or I don't know. save us. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. So that's their scientific name. You know, just... 
So evolution, again, we, we talked about it a couple weeks ago in Tigers. You had the myocid 60 million years ago. Bears came out 30 million years ago. Bears basically divided into three families or subfamilies. The real bears, Ursidae, mm-hmm. right? That's what John loves. Yes. Then you have the, the giant panda and the speck bear. <laughs> Oh, they're not real bears. <laughs> so we did the panda. I don't and, think John's number. Uh, he's never worked with grizzlies. Uh, no, uh, right, okay. I don't think he's worked with brown or blacks. Uh, okay, but okay. definitely polar bears and oh, yeah. sun bears. Yeah, he worked with sun bears. Yeah, sun bears. Many, yeah, yeah really so we have cool. many bear species to cover. Sloth Spec bear. Bears. Oh my gosh, we have to put that on our list. Yeah, That's sloth bears. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There's some good ones. Now, they think brown bears came to the Americas about 50,000 years ago. I did pull up a quick study. It was Nature, published in 2017. Again, for the folks that have been list- haven't listened to us that long, Nature's the number one scientific magazine. Science and Nature, the two best. Like they just- It's like the Patriots currently or the uh, Yankees. Yeah, yeah whatever <laughs> top teams in anything. They're the best. The best of the best. Uh, definitely best not my – unfortunately not my Lions or Tigers from Michigan. Yeah, no. No, no, no. So this one was was interesting. They looked at gene flow, history of bears. So going back, you know, this all kind of diverged out 5 million years ago, all the current species of bears of real bear. The panda bear split off about 20 million years ago, and we've covered that. They're special. Um, Yeah, and the speck bear uh, split off about 10 million years ago. So your black bears, you know, split off 3 million years ago roughly. And then sun bears, sloth bears, a little bit farther past that. The most interesting thing about this whole thing with evolution is just how closely related brown bears are with polar bears. And it's been in the last million years, probably 500,000 years ago, where polar bears went, and we covered this a long time ago, but broke off from the brown bears. And mm-hmm. went and survived and, and started to specialize living in the Arctic, right. which is going away. It's really sad. But anyways, that does lead to really quick hybridization, which I thought was cool because I've seen this popping in the news. Angie, I think as polar bears start to range further south due to, I mean, the, the sea ice is not lasting. We know that. It's a fact. This isn't debate. You know, I, and I cannot wait for conservation news. I have so much pent up about this <laughs> this debate. It's been a while, right? Yeah. Oh, there's this scientist that's just a hack. I called her out like two weeks ago or the penguin episode. I just, oh, she's got me so fired up because I've looked at her history and it's just, oh. Anyways, we'll get there. But there is some natural mating between brown bears or grizzlies and polar bears. Well, and, I mean, right. They're, like you said, they're closely re- related on the genetic tree. Right. And yeah. if they are pushed further south and their numbers are declining, which mm-hmm. means – and their resources are declining, so they're hungry mm-hmm. and not able to find mates, mm-hmm. sure, I'm sure if they bump into a grizzly, hey, you know? Yeah, yeah the, 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 the music's playing. You know, I'm a boy. You're a girl. It's the right type of season. And I'm more handsome because I'm big and tall, you know, I'm six, five. No, Hey, that's kidding. I'm not going there, but you know what I mean? You know, yeah. nature calls and they run into each other and they mate and they, and they have offspring and right. the offspring, they call them growlers and they're actually fertile. I was like, are they fertile oh, or different. not? And they, yeah. Yeah. Because What's again, their chromosome I think, numbers, Chris, I, since you pretty, played Jeopardy with me. Uh, 52. For both? They both have the same number? I don't know. Ah, busted. (laughs) No, they are the same, though. I know they're the same. Hold on. Oh, they're the same. Okay. They are the same. The the speck bear and panda bear are different. I know we we covered this before, Mm -hmm. so I will give you an answer here in two seconds. I mean, I definitely don't know the answer, but I love that you don't know it either. (laughs) Uh, I do. I do. I do. I was close. It's 74. That's not close. (laughs) <laughs> I guess if you're playing at least it's price is right rules, you didn't go over. So I'll give you hey, that. I knew they were the same though. They're the same. Yes. Seventy four. Well, and that's 74. how their offspring can okay. be fertile, right? I mean that's yeah, yeah. how that yeah, happens. Because the chromosomes are the same and, and they're pretty Well, how many out, right? are speculated to of these whatever you called them? A small handful. Small handful. They've only found a few small handful of this. It's not a normal occurrence. I mean I think I think that polar bear's got a range pretty far south. 
sure. you know, to, to run into a female grizzly. And it's usually the female, it's a male polar bear and a female grizzly is from what I read. It's not the other way around. It's not a, a male grizzly and a female polar bear. It's usually the female grizzly and a male polar bear. And she's like, whatever, I'm in heat. There's no guys around. Let's go. Sure. You know, and well, she's that, pregnant I mean, and has That's babies. the valid point that you bring up is that, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, she has her yeah. season and, hey, and they're receptive. Nature calls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Angie, I looked for, I couldn't really find anything cool on the tallest or smallest uh, bear. We've already covered this one. Arctotherium, 10 feet tall, weighed 3,500 pounds from South America. Just enormous. Only died out a few hundred years cool. ago. Yeah, yeah. I still, I still think the elephant bird's the coolest thing I've found so <laughs> <laughs> We've got to do a, a like the greatest, uh, the greatest hits. The greatest episode of it. Or something. Yeah. I know. Sixteen hundred pound chicken. I mean, come on, it stands ten feet tall. Like, yeah. Imagine the thing chasing you. It's like I was just uh, with my, you know, with, with my friend Julie and Sophia, and we were saw this exhibit with these tall birds, and I it just came up. I was like, they had these beautiful cranes, and they must have been like fifteen feet tall. And I'm like, just take the head off. Now look at it. Now imagine that bird. I started telling them about the elephant bird. I'm such a dork. <laughs> I'm starting you to are a dork, but we my... love you. Yes. Mm-hmm. I know. I am a, I'm a dork. So grizzly bears live 15 to 20 years in the wild. The oldest under human care was 47, which is extremely rare to be that, wow. that old. Yeah. yeah. Um, in yeah. Yellowstone Park, female bears have mm-hmm. been known to re- reproduce up to 25 years of age too. Yeah. That yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're protected there. Right. So they, they sure. have a lot of protections there. And, you know, I think Canada is really more remote places. It's, it's a harder, harder living than that. Mm-hmm. Bears. I mean, bears, 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 so much fun, extremely intelligent, which is really great. Cause that goes into Bryce Andrews interview. I mean, we talk about, how to it's just listen to the interview, read the book, get the book. It's, it's insane how smart these bears are. It's insane. It's insane how they problem solve. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and we talk a little bit about that in the interview on Thursday. Oh, cool. I think one of the I things love that, that I love that I can't wait. Yeah. Oh, it's good. It's a good one. The other thing I really love about bears age is how good they can smell, like how acute better than dogs, better than hound dogs. Probably one of the best mammals in the world for smell. Wow. I guess I didn't really, realize it was better than dogs but man that's because if that's the case it's i mean it's incredible yeah yeah they think they have the the best sense of smell in all the animal kingdom the most receptors or something the most yeah Uh they smell a carcass from 20 miles away it was at 40 kilometers away like so that's when you go camping and you have food and you're out on the campfire and you're cooking steaks and pork and beans or whatever you're doing those bears can smell it I think when I go camping when my boys get a little bit older, if I'm going around here around the Ocala National Park or places local to me, we're going to do meatless Monday every day that we camp. Yes. <laughs> but to see they'll smell the berries. They'll still show up. I know. That's true, darling. They're omnivores. Jeez. <laughs> no. Can't win. You, you can't. You know, that's where you get bear-proof containers. And when sure. you go into bear country, you've got to be really smart. I've seen bears, not Yellowstone, but Yosemite Mm -hmm. here near me in California, black bears breaking into cars, like breaking windows, opening doors to get at food. Sure. They call it bear CPR, actually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's that move when they get on a canister and pump up and down, jump up and down to try to open it. And there's several places either in Yellowstone or Yosemite, I think Yellowstone, that makes containers is CPR proof as possible, basically. So oh, that's crazy. CPR. <laughs> and they that's have, good. And, that's good. and then they try like if, okay, if the bear can't get in it within an hour, they'll like give up and things like that. So, uh, I mean, people are trying to, and I, and I, I loved reading that because it just shows me a really positive signs of how humans are trying to work with cohabitating yep. with yep. bears yep. and, and how yeah, that's better good. That's good. And, how, and how better to reduce that conflict, um, especially between campers and things like that, because the park Absolutely. obviously wants people to come there to view the wildlife and enjoy the natural areas, but at the same time, minimize these smart bears coming in and, and taking things that aren't theirs. Incredibly smart, incredibly intelligent. Then add that they're great swimmers. You know, a lot of people probably have seen bear videos of bears swimming, catching salmon. I love like the that. salmon ones. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Crazy. And then they are incredibly quick and fast and they can reach speeds over to 50 kilometers an hour or 35 miles per hour. 
But it's not just that how fast they get so running. faster it's than how Usain Bolt quickly. for sure. Oh, you, you're screwed. I think you're, you cannot outrun a bear. Period. I read somewhere that they can run for a short period as fast as horses, but I don't think that's true. The world record for a thoroughbred race horse was 44 miles per hour. Mm-hmm. So yeah, close, close. So and that's the fastest of the fast. So and this is. We haven't seen a bear in being timed or anything, but yeah, they're, they're fast. And it's just, you know, Bryce talks about it. Other people talk about how quickly they can move Mm -hmm. when they want to. Mm -hmm. Now it says, I've read some of this and I guess we can bust a myth right here Mm -hmm. that only young grizzlies can climb trees. No, (laughs) you sent me a video. I sent you that video of a mama bear climbing a tree like it's nobody's business. Mm -hmm. And she, and I've got, I will post this on our show notes. I know we say we will post videos. (laughs) I will post this one because I, my jaw hit the ground. She trees a black bear that was near her cub. So you watch the video, she sees him. She immediately barks the alarm. The cub takes off in the opposite direction. Like this is all instantaneous. And she just charges down this hill. The black bear sees her, climbs this tree, she climbs a tree like it's no, seriously, it, it, it's insane. And then she goes back down and then gets angry again and climbs mm-hmm. right back up it. And she just knocked branches off left and right. And I was like, oh my God, if you run <laughs> mad mama bear, yes. you don't climb a tree. She'll get yes. you quick. So <laughs> myth number one, yeah. the best way to get away from an aggressive bear is by running. We already nailed that one down. Rongo bongo. Uh, running no. will likely trigger a yeah. chase response, and you definitely, you definitely, mm-hmm. potentially even a horse, can't out, nope. can't out. Not run me, a bear, not right? me. <laughs> and definitely, no. No. they can run fast uphill. And second myth: if you can climb a tree to escape from a biz- grizzly bear, Rongo Bongo, uh, they can definitely climb, as Chris mentioned. Um, they will get in trees. And much better than you will be ever climb ever. Yes. So don't do that. And then just really yeah. quick, uh, since we're on the topic of myths, um, a great little handy dandy resource called the misunderstood bear by the U S fish and wildlife services out of Colorado. And we can put on our show notes has some of these myths about grizzly bears. Um, one of the myths is that bears are naturally aggressive towards humans. Uh, that's not true. Uh, as I mentioned from hiking mm-hmm. in the woods, I learned in Glacier National Park that they're more scared of you than you are of them, especially if you make noises and things like that. Uh, aggression only comes as a last resort, usually when they feel threatened. So sing, clap, mm-hmm. dance when you're hiking through the woods and you should probably be fine. Uh, they mm-hmm. can sometimes become aggressive if they've been used to being exposed to human food and garbage as well. So... As Chris mm-hmm. pointed out, wrap your stuff up, block it up. You should be good to go. And then the misunderstood bear also mentions that a bear standing on its hind legs, as I mentioned that I've seen in a lot of the YouTube videos or some of you have maybe seen in the wild, that it's preparing to charge. Well, this is not true. Um, it's actually usually on its hind legs to get a better view or to smell things, um, and being on its hind legs is not really an attack position. An attack position is actually probably being down on its all. Running legs. towards you. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really angry. Mm-hmm. And along the attack line is it's a myth that if a bear huffs or growls or slaps the ground, it's about to attack. Um, threat displays such as snorting, salivating, snapping jaws, body posturing, etc., are meant to communicate dominance like stay away. So they're actually doing this to avoid a fight, not to engage in one. And the last myth is that if a bear does start charging, it's attacking. So bears often bluff charge and they're trying to scare you away. So it can be difficult to distinguish between a bluff charge and a real charge. I would imagine as your heart's (laughs) about to explode through your chest. (laughs) Yes. 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 (laughs) However, However, bluff charges usually occur with a hopping or bouncing motion Mm -hmm. with the bear's head up and hind legs stiff. Mm -hmm. So if it looks more like a bunny hopping, hop charging towards you, hopefully you're okay. Oh, I just don't ever want to run into that. I just don't. Yeah. As much camping as I've done in my life and, you know, in the military charging, you know, walking around the woods, 
I just don't ever, you know, I just want them to, I want to see them from a distance and admire them. Correct. Yes. That is the goal. Yeah. That is definitely the goal. Yeah. Yeah. And li- live and let live. The nutrition really quick, you know, we've already talked a little bit about this, what they do. They eat a lot and this will roll well into behavior. You know, bears eat a lot in the warmer months so they can gain weight and especially coming out in spring, you know, when they come out of hibernation or not, we'll find out here in a second. But from that winter, you know, where they're thin, they're going to eat as much as they can to put weight back on. So prepare for the next winter. So they can eat, you know, 90 pounds of food a day on average, 40 kilograms, and they can gain two plus pounds each day in body weight. That's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think it's, yeah, it's important to point out that they, we think of them as carnivores, but they're not, they're omnivores. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They'll eat almost anything that's nutritious. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're after my own heart. Yeah, the same <laughs> You're going to go eat some grubs and worms and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> some fungus. Uh, but there does. Their, their diet will change, as Chris mentioned, among seasonal availability. And any they eat plant foods, grasses, sedges, roots, mosses, bulbs, fruits, nuts, berries, tubers. Who doesn't like a good tuber? And this is what I found super fascinating. They consume insects, fungi, roots. Uh, they will look for mice dig for ground squirrels, marmots, and other animals out of their burrows. And this was my favorite, Chris. Mm. What? They love to eat moths. Oh, really? I didn't know that. (laughs) That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moth, moth, so M-O-T-H, like the butterflies, but the nighttime ones, moth ones. I need, I'm not a bug expert, so I guess I don't even really know the difference between a butterfly and a moth. So anyways, different pod for a different Expert, people right want now. us to do insects, and I'm like, uh, I don't, no, you don't. So our comfort <laughs> no, zone. You don't. We don't know insects. How about this? You pay me our top Patreon <laughs> price, and then we can talk. But okay. until then, it is. I mean, invertebrates were super out of my comfort zone. That jellyfish one took me two weeks to prepare. I know. I two know. weeks. It's different. Uh, wait, wait till I'm we get to uh, <laughs> Suplapod in a few weeks. So we got one coming. I know. I know. Well, I know. I, I, octopus. I that that I will. Yeah. I, whatever. I love that. Yeah. So because octopuses would take over the world if they had a backbone. So yeah, we'll, we'll, would, we'll see if would. that's true or not yeah. in a few weeks here. But anyways, moths. So getting back to this, grizzlies love moth larva. They have been demonstrated as an, an especially important source of protein and fat when they are gaining weight in the fall. Researchers have observed brown bears willing to climb to alpine heights in Montana's Glacier National Park. Mm-hmm. Woo, woo. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hey, Aaron. Mm-hmm. That's my good girlfriend. Uh, we've hiked all around Glac- Glacier National Park yeah. together. Uh, we hang out still all the time. But they will climb high in Montana's Glacier National Park in order to feast on these flying little appetizers. They can turn over rocks and they'll spend Chris up to 14 hours a day devouring over 40,000 moths. Wow. Who wow. knew? Maybe they're fat, high in fat, maybe. I don't know. You know, uh, protein is what was yeah, read high in, in, the protein? Research, in the, okay. what I was reading about, but ha, huh, right? So huh. really, really cool. They, um, you know, they, they're very resourceful. And which is really interesting. It's probably why they've been quite successful until humans came along, right? Uh, but of course they do other big things, moose, elk, sheep, mountain goats. Rotting um, carcasses, especially after oh, the yeah, winter. Oh yeah, they're eaters. Yeah, yeah, they love it. They love it. Uh huh. And of course salmon, as, mm. uh, Chris has mentioned. And Chris, according to the literature, they have, there has been reports of cannibalism among brown bears. So they will eat the carcasses of black bears in Canada. Oh. So they're giving new meaning to bear eat bear world, right? So uh, I think when we say omnivore, we should probably actually call them opportunistic as well, right? Um, yeah, they. I mean, it's just such a great strategy to survive in the wild, you know, to... Mm-hmm to eat as much as they do. And it's, again, it just still amazes me about pandas. Pandas are just all bamboo. <laughs> it's just, they've got the carnivore stomach, but they're just, or omnivore stomach. They're, and they they're special. Bamboo. They are That's very special. the nice way to say it. Yeah, they're <laughs> cute as a button, but they're, the way they've evolved is just special. They're a little very bit special. different. So check they're out, just if, a little bit different. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely check out those podcasts if you're interested in panda bears. You should be because they're fat. I mean, besides being adorable um, right. Right. to look at, don't they're they're they are not not aggressive, so don't go near them. But in the same instance, yeah, their physiology is is striking. Yeah, it's very, very different, very, very different. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so let's talk. You know, not just physiology, but some behavior stuff that you ran across specific to. I mean, good about the nutrition stuff. What are some of the other things that they like to do? Yeah, well, I mean, they're they are active any time of day, um, and, but they're going to generally eat all of these random things from carrion to moths to fruit, nuts, and berries um, in the morning or the evening, and then they'll rest sometimes during the day. Uh, they'll also use those powerful claws and um, that hump on their on their shoulder is very muscular. Because they're such great diggers, so they, yeah. they use their nails, to, they use their claws to dig a lot. And so they'll excavate a shallow depression to lie in during the day when they are napping or at nighttime. And they do travel a lot, okay? So they've been observed traveling hundreds of kilometers during the autumn to reach these food supplies, whether it's the moths up in the high alpine forest of Glacier National Park or wherever they need to, to basically fatten up, right? Um, such as the salmon streams and then areas of high berry production. And when they do make a burrow or a den, they'll usually find like a sheltered slope, maybe use a large stone or roots of a mature tree. They do typically keep these dens from year to year. And the reason these dens or shale depressions are so important is because Brown bears or grizzlies basically experience a period of inactivity from October to December, and then they'll resume activity from March to May. With the exact period of this hibernation being Mm -hmm. dependent on their location, the weather conditions, the altitude, and things like that. So in the southern areas that they live or inhabit, this period of inactivity is brief and may not occur at all, depending. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm calling this a period of inactivity, because it is a time for grizzlies to be in a deep sleep, like a hibernation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Their body temperature drops by a few degrees. They don't eat anything. They don't drink any water. They're sleeping, right? Hibernation. But technically, depending on the location and the altitude and all that, it's not usually a true hibernation because these bears can generally be aroused uh, from this winter sleep. It's what, what, who was it? We did, we did a whole thing on hibernation the physiology behind it. Oh, I'm trying to think of the species we covered 60 species ago. (laughs) One of the ones that we talked about, because we called it Toper and the other ones, I don't know. Anyway, so it's really not, you're saying it's really not a true hibernation. They don't really, are knocked out for six months yeah, and then awaken. I, I, okay. I guess technically, yes, according to hibernation experts or people that study this, which I admittedly so am not one of them. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. We study horses, horses and ungulates, some of them are seasonal, things like that. But You study yes, rhinos? You study rhinos. They don't hibernate. Black-footed ferrets? Yeah, <laughs> I'll no, tell you they that. don't yeah, hibernate they don't. Uh, I mean, But the hibernation physiology or this period of inactivity or how, how, however you want to call it is – really fascinating from a physiological point of view. And we should probably dedicate, we should pick another species that does go into a true hibernation Mm -hmm, and maybe mm -hmm. dork out on that for a while, because it is, Mm -hmm. if you think about it, uh, it's pretty fascinating to be able to not eat or drink or defecate for a while. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, well, I mean, I know in, in the South, like squirrels, cause we're gonna do squirrels soon for Xander. That was one of his requests. Do squirrels hibernate in the northern, you know, in Canada? Those are things we should ask about, you know, ask and look into. Because- yeah. I feel like in the north, you're going to see them out too a little bit in the wintertime, but I could be completely wrong. It's been years since I've been hanging out in the woods of Michigan in the wintertime. <laughs> well, stay tuned there. for that podcast. So at some time yeah. in 2019, we will get to it, I promise you. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, so yes, we will, we'll, we'll go into hibernation more in detail, but for, for lack of time, um, focusing on grizzlies is they are typically solitary. So unless it's a, unless it's a mama and her babies, they want to be by themselves. And so 
that's what makes them happy, right? That's how they, that's how they are. Um, sometimes you'll see them gather in a large, in larger numbers. If it's like a major f- food source, maybe like the salmon run, mm-hmm. um, or you might see one or two mamas with younger foraging cubs and then that's okay. And, th- and they do cross each other's paths, but typically they're going to be, uh, solitary and really the only actual social bonds, mm-hmm. uh, the snuggling and the cuddly stuff that you think of a teddy bear, that's mm-hmm. only going to happen between um, a female and her young. And Chris, now for one of my favorite parts of the podcast. They're all my favorite, but you know. The end? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know. I love Never, this. never, never. Um, so fun. I do. Well, I actually do really like the end because we go over, I have a great conservation organization this week to talk about, and you've got some great people to talk I've got about. One too, well. yeah. So, yeah, 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 that that probably is actually my favorite part. So, this is my second favorite part. Is I'm sorry, evolution is by far my favorite, obviously. I know. You're, <laughs> so, yeah, you're, you're, I you're love pulling out these dorky facts. You're like, no way. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, uh, but no, communication, right? Behavior. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, behavior is your thing. Yeah, that's your yes. thing. Yeah. And to be Honest, obviously, I specialize more in ungulates, and mm-hmm. so that's the behavior I'm really familiar with. Mm-hmm. So large omnivores, carnivores, however you want to call them, uh, behavior is is something that this podcast has really opened my eyes about, especially covering mm-hmm. tigers recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I've just – I'm really actually quite drawn to it. I, I – mm-hmm. uh, maybe it was a, another calling in a previous life to, mm-hmm. to watch mm-hmm. carnivore behavior, but – but brown bears are amazing the way that they communicate. They do it through scent. They do it through body language, which that's where behavior comes in and vocalizations. And when we think of grizzly bears standing on their hind legs, about to attack, growling or roaring or however mm-hmm. you want to call it, that's an iconic sound. And we'll play a clip here in a second. Everybody would know that as a, oh, no, Snap. moment, right? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> Snap. oh, my pants just got heavier, right? Like, my brown pants, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, I've got brown pants to match the brown bear. So yeah. everybody would recognize that. But what's really fascinating is these vocalizations, true vocalizations like that are actually mm. really rare in mm. grizzly bears. They typically rely more on, like, what they call non-voice sounds, so moans, grunts, maybe a growl of a mom uh, communicating with her young, uh, sometimes bellowing, things like that, huffing, snorting, a clacking of teeth, a popping sound of the jaw or blowing air in and out of the nostrils, and all of these different sounds to indicate agitation, aggression, fear, affiliative or like friendly behaviors if it's a mom and a cub. And I just think that it's really indicative of of how much bear behavior from movies and I'm watching these videos on YouTube. So I'm part of the problem. No, just kidding. Uh, but I think it brings up a really good point of how these vocalizations or how we see them either in movies or portrayed in our deepest, darkest fears as them being so bad and aggressive when really most of their communication is not through these large growls or roars they're more generally trying to just communicate quietly mm-hmm. and, and, and get the message across. So they're definitely – grizzly bears are definitely misunderstood, I think, by the general pub- okay. public. And it, basically them just looking at you makes you fearful. And that a lot of times that's obviously not what they are trying to get across. But I'm going to play for you this popping sound that a grizzly will make. And I just think it's really interesting. It's a uh, unique way to communicate from a bear. That's the huffing, the huff, huff, huff. Yes, and if you listen closely, uh, if Mm -hmm. you play it back, if you're an extreme vocalization dork like Chris and I, but if you play it back, you can, it's the breathing, but then there's also like a, like, Boy, I'm horrible at imitating sounds, but if there's a click sound in yeah. it almost, uh, which is just, just really different. And, uh, and for me, it just uh, goes to show what a com, everybody can imagine what a moan or a grunt sounds like. And of course, the, 
uh, the classic right. roar that's in every movie or whatever. Uh, but this sound to me was just, they have, they have, I don't want to use the word mm. language, right? That needs to be proven by scientific right, evidence right. before it becomes a quote unquote language, but they definitely have a complex system of vocalization mm-hmm. that all means something. And, and so, yes, if you do hear this <laughs> popping sound, that's pretty much an agitated female. Okay. So. Oh my gosh. Are you making fun no, of that I'm way? just like, oh my God, if I heard that in the wild, I would just. Right. Curl That's up in a actually, ball and that one you should be more worried yeah. about. She's, she's, she's not happy. Yeah. She's agitated. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, or, or if you're a little grizzly cub, it's kind of like, uh oh, mom's, mom's upset. Mm. Uh, but just because, but since I played the a little bit lesser known jaw popping sound, I have to compliment that with the iconic roar. Uh, probably should have, Xander did an actually pretty good job yeah, yeah, yeah. of making this sound, but we probably should have uh, opened up with this or maybe you can put this in the front of the podcast, but here we go. I guarantee you they use that in movies because I've heard that before and yes. not from a real bear, you know, like monster movies or whatever. They use a grizzly bear roar. Yes, they're all, I think there's a lot, the similar one that's uh, around on all the different sites. Uh, this was right, a, right, right. an outdoor, uh, outdoor kind of DNR type site. Uh, but yeah, so it is, you know, they, but yeah, tons of different teeth clacking, jaw popping, whether it's snorting, grunting, growling, all of it's super impressive. And to also indicate reproductive, um, status, status. Where yeah, at, yeah. yeah, where they're at. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So good. Is that roll into repro? Well, sh- I'm glad you asked, Chris. <laughs> I I thought you were the never going to ask get... me to talk about reproduction. Oh, uh, I cannot wait this week. I I mean, I had fun doing penguins because penguins are just so beautiful, and it was just penguin World Penguin Day. This week, I'm going to be posting so many cub pictures on Instagram. <laughs> I'm going to go crazy with it because it's so fun. You <laughs> should. Like, they're so pretty. They are. Yeah. They're. Gorgeous. I mean, this nature's perfection, right? Nature's beauty. And it's incredible. And the way that we get more cubs is through reproduction. And so what happens is typically they're seasonal breeders. So, so grizzlies will typically breed, uh, between May and early July, uh, mating season about two and a half months. And researchers believe that a lot of this is indicative of photo period. And so that's how much light is like we, I definitely know coming from Michigan and Florida, we have like daylight savings and the photo period chains, right? Shorter days, daylight in the wintertime, longer in the summertime. And so the, when more daylight starts coming in the summertime or around May, June, July, that helps stimulate production of a lot of re- reproductive hormones. And so in the male, it's going to be testosterone and the female, it's going to be a lot of estrogens. And of course, those are really important hormones for bears to do bear reproductive things, right? So with a male, it's going to help him actively seek out a female and fight off other competition. And with a female, the estrogen is going to make her also want to seek out male and accept his attention. So I always like to talk about when male and female animal meet, right? The courtship behavior, because it's just fun for me to learn more about these animals, but also to picture humans and, and to see if we can relate to any of these courtship behaviors. And so with grizzly bears, I must admit, I don't know if courtship is necessarily the right word to describe um, how he interacts mm-hmm. with a female when he is trying to solicit her for breeding. I feel like it's more just biding his time. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of males in this day and age can actually relate to that. Yeah. Like, Good old fashioned days of courtship of opening <laughs> car doors and pulling yeah, out chairs. I still do that. I and, still do that. I do that all the well, time. Well, my husband yeah, always know. buys me roses, so he definitely yeah. does a lot of courtship. Yeah. So he's not a grizzly bear. Uh, but yeah, so no, what the grizzlies do, the males, is they basically can recognize when a female is an estrus and is an estrus and showing some receptive behaviors. And so over these hours and days, it can sometimes last one days. It can be up to 10 days. He basically just follows her around. He and will fight off other males that might come into her territory. And yeah, it's, 
pretty easy to recognize courting pairs as they call them Mm -hmm. because the Mm -hmm. male is just following her and he's just persistent and Mm -hmm. he will walk behind her. He'll shadow her one, uh, one, I love it. One website described it as like, he will shadow her with movements like he has a laser sight affixed to her rump. <laughs> God, okay. I don't know why I did it in that voice. I don't usually change my uh, voice. Yeah. Just that website was a little ridiculous, but it, it did give me a pretty hilarious uh, visual on it. You, yeah, that, uh, yeah. And it's not too far from the truth, right? Like um, she is uh, probably um, through her urine excreting some pheromones. And of course, uh, with, as you mentioned, great smell, he can uh, uh, probably even understand what her estrus cycle is like and where she's at in her estrus cycle. So uh, I don't think that website's totally off, but I just thought it was hilarious. <laughs> things like that. When you're an animal behavior dork like me, things like that know, will, will, will keep me, will keep me giggling and Googling till like wee hours yeah. of the night. Right. The morning, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so generally there's not a ton of uh, cuddly teddy bear romance involved, if you will. Um, and this may last, um, they'll copulate anywhere from like 10 to 30 days. And this is once again in May and July, May through July. And then once the bears breed and the female uh, becomes pregnant, she experiences what's called delayed implantation or embryonic diapause. And we've talked about delayed implantation before with other uh, big cats and obviously polar bears, other bear species. But basically what this is, is after fertilization, the embryonic blastocyst exhibit delayed implantation. Uh, but it's been a found, it's been found across many different mammalian orders. So like seven or eight different orders do it. So we've touched on, like I said, the tiger and the polar bear, uh, a couple others, but it's fascinating folks. I think, uh, I mean, science science is so cool. Why do they do this? How do they evolve to do this? People still really don't know, but, but what it does in the grizzlies is this blastocyst becomes implanted approximately five months after mating Mm -hmm. five, five months. It's just there in suspended animation. Yeah. 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 I kind of just made up that word, uh, but I like it. Suspended. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. it's just there. It's not growing. Yeah. It's not needing nutrients. What? Mm-hmm. I don't, yeah, where is it just, there. Yeah. just bouncing around the uterus? Like, I don't even understand. And, and the feet, there might be a couple of them, right? With female grizzlies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Aye, aye, aye. And so, so typically the blastocyst will implant usually in November when the female has entered her winter sleep. That kind of makes sense, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but then the gestation, so the actual growth period of the fetus is six to eight weeks of gestation, of true actual gestation, uh, with birth then occurring in January and March while the female is still in this hibernation phase. So the total gestation time, including the delayed implantation, is 180 to 266 days. And then... When the miracle of life happens, two to three offspring are born per litter. These cubs are born blind, helpless, and naked, and they're teensy, weensy, teensy, beansies, about 340 to 680 grams. So after all yeah, that, time, yeah. yeah, just yeah. crazy. Um, and by three months, the cubs are about 15 kilograms, and by six months, they're about 25 kilograms. Lactation in the female um, will continue from 18 to 30 months long after her cubs are eating berries and moths and carrion and meat and whatever. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, but the cubs, they do being with such a complex diet and, or communication, vocalizations, all of that, um, hunting, right. For pre- uh, being a predator, apex predator, the cubs will remain with mother for typically, up to three years, but at least uh, minimally, at least the second spring of their life, sometimes a third mm-hmm, or fourth. Mm-hmm. And of course the male brown bear, the boar, he doesn't mm-hmm. assist with any. No, of it. no, no, <laughs> no, no. It's all mom. All mom. So, so that's She's when that's good. where that, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we call different moms here in the United States. She's either a tiger mom or a bear mom. Yeah. I don't know what kind of mom, yeah. mom. I'm just an Angie mom, but but yes, uh, a You're bear a mom. mom. But I think it's actually a compliment if you get called a tiger or a bear mom because 
that's a lot, a lot of input and care is going into these cubs to train them, keep them alive, train them. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, they're amazing. I mean, they're amazing moms, amazing species, the conservation status, uh, fortunately right now, least concerned, but we have captured how they've been decimated in the last how, hundred years. So they're how just, are they least concerned with only like maybe 1500 because, being in? Well, in the U.S., so in the U.S., they're protected by the Endangered Species Act. We'll save the, the debate in conservation news, what's going on in the politics here, but overall throughout the globe. I mean, obviously, remember IUCN, they have to prioritize these animals too. Sure. Good there's point, a, Chris. There's a 110,000 in the world, which is nothing. You're talking Northern Hemisphere. That So they're stable. The, the populations are stable. So they're doing okay now, but still a highlight on a species that you know drastically was reduced uh, due to human activity. Now, I know Angie has an organization. I've got one. People in carnivores, I'll let Angie go first, and then I'll touch upon mine real quick because it's, it's Bryce Andrews, you know, and, and kind of I'll talk about what they're doing in Montana. Yes, Chris. I'm very excited this week to highlight the Grizzly Bear Foundation out of Vancouver, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. I've heard it was one of my my yes, my late father had traveled it, extensively, and Vancouver one was one of his favorites. So I've got to get there. And you say also that oh, it's beautiful. And our good friend Jonathan uh, lives I up know. there. I need- British Columbia is probably one of the most beautiful places on earth, period. I know. So I really, it's, it's definitely on my bucket list. And, but, but for those of you in the area, um, check out Grizzly Bear Foundation, right? They are awesome. Uh, they're dedicated to the long term survival and the well being of the grizzly bear, which of course is a keystone species. And they focus on three important tiers of being research, public education, and conservation. So the Grizzly Bear Foundation publishes a lot of information about the history, ecology, and conservation in management and economic impacts of grizzly bears. And these reports provide recommendations to ensure a viable future for Canada's grizzly bears. So it's really important. And then for education, they build a community of grizzly bear advocates that share facts and articles and videos. So of course it's one of, it's like a sister organization to us, right? That's what we do. We're Mm -hmm, educators mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. at all creatures Mm podcast. And Mm -hmm. they also develop grizzly bear education units for elementary schools and making sure that young people are aware of the awesomeness and conservation issues facing grizzly bears. And lastly for conservation, uh, grizzly bear foundation, has a ton of different areas that they support both in the local level and then of course at the level of the province to conserve these guys in the wild and help keep their populations healthy. And so you can check out their website. It's wonderful, well done. And they have a lot of amazing bear facts on there. And so you can find the Grizzly Bear Foundation at grizzlybearfoundation.com or on Facebook. And they have a really neat program called Grizzly Guardian that you can get involved in. And if you do live near Vancouver, Jonathan, mm-hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you need a date, they have a uh, <laughs> Night of the Grizzlies, which is in September. And it's a gala fundraiser to, of course, promote uh, uh, bear awareness and conservation of these iconic species. So yeah, just a really yeah. good group. Yeah, I know. I know. It's they're they're oh, Angie again. This is why I'm going to be pushing conservation optimism. It, it's been trending on Instagram now, and and I really subscribe to it. That yeah, it's it, it's you know we paint this bleak picture, but there's people out there working hard each and every day. That has been so eye opening since we started this podcast. Yeah, it has been so eye opening. It has, and really, there's only been a few species that have let me down. Hippos yeah. being one of them, and yeah. so hippos. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know. Hippo organization. Me and yeah. John, we've got to do something for those darn yeah. hippos. Love them. I know, and they're I in know, trouble. I know. They are. They are. So the, the, what I wanted to cover is people and carnivores. This is author Bryce Andrews work, what he's doing in Montana. Um, you know, you listen more about his story, how he kind of gave up his job, what he was doing to fight and, and, and he doesn't like the word fight, but you know, how he puts it is find solutions on how to get people in these carnivores to get along. 
So it's, it's, it's a wonderful organization, uh, a small organization, but out in the field working with the local population and protecting these animals in Montana that we can learn from them. Like, especially the stuff he was doing in, in describing in this book, we learn from that and then export it throughout the country, throughout the world. So check out peopleandcarnivores.org. We'll have the link up there. You know, they're working hard out in the field. Again, a, a smaller organization that's growing and, and needs our love and support. So check them out. Now, Angie, really quick before I get to what to do, if you've seen the bear, is conservation tip of the week. I'm trying to think what could affect bears the most. And again, we're on this climate change thing. So that you know, one of the things that we don't do, especially, you know, people with kids and we have all these video game systems, things turned on. Whenever you leave a room, if you ever see those light, little green lights, usually it's 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 red or green, and that's some device like say a Nintendo Switch or something or a Xbox, TV, stereo, whatever. That means they're still on and drawing power. Yeah. So they're still burning power. So you really should just unplug them. Or mm -hmm. find a way, like if, if you have a power strip, just turn off the power strip, Yeah. power down your computer, and then just switch off the power strip. Absolutely. We had this Boom. talk just recently yeah. in our house because our uh, consumer, our power bill is going up. And so we're trying to strategize what little things can we do uh, better to reduce it. And that is definitely one of them. Those little lights on just things yeah. you wouldn't even think about. Um, right. That on elect coffee maker, electronics, maybe. coffee yeah. maker. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you never know. DVD players, uh, uh -huh. VCRs. I don't think anybody has those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the beta tapes or yeah. <laughs> I suppose the eighties was the seventies. No, it was the, we inherited, the, the we, we inherited one. Mm. Oh geez. About three or four moves ago. So probably 10 years ago. Yeah. That is a VC. I still have a VCR DVD combo. Yeah, player. That's awesome. But we that's only play DVDs. Awesome. So, but yeah, 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 yeah. But, but that I light know. will yeah, be on awesome. sometimes and it's yeah. just a good, like just turn it all off, like go all the way through yeah. it. So no, that's if a, you do that, you can save 10%. Yeah. You shave off 10% of your power. That's a great one, Chris. Right there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there you go. So that's very simple and to use. Okay. Let's get to bears, bears in the wild. What happens if you run into a bear, things like that. Okay. You don't run, open up. You don't climb a tree. Boom. No, absolutely not. Your chance of getting attacked by a bear is very rare. One in 2.2 million. So in North America, three people per year are killed by bears. Okay. So Again, less than 15, cows. Yes, cows were like 26 per year are killed by cows in the United States. 15 people a year are killed by dogs. You have a greater chance of being killed by a bee sting than a bear. Okay. Bears want to avoid us if they can. Now, I will say brown bears are more dangerous than polar or black bear encounters. Those lead to, to worse injuries. When a bear attacks, it lasts less than three minutes. And what they're doing usually is to reduce a threat. They're not trying to kill or eat you. They just see you as a threat. They want to reduce you and run off to be safe. So the best thing anybody can do if you're in bear country is get bear mace. They sell it everywhere now. Reading it, you should know how to use it. So you should practice with bear mace, especially if you're out there in, in the wilds. Also wear it in the front of your belt. You don't want to be fumbling for it, you know, all nervous. And like you said, <laughs> brown pants, all that stuff. You want to be able to get to it. And it's very effective. They say it's like 92% effective wow. in wearing off mm -hmm. a bear attack. Yeah. But it happens so quickly. So you have to be able to know how to use it and use it well, quickly. Well, and that was the thing, Chris. When I uh, moved to Chicago in my early 20s after college, I had mace because I was kind of a country girl. So I'm like, oh, I'll get mace. And then, but after a while, I realized I it's just safer for me to travel with my big dog because big friends, yeah. My yeah, big, big, my big too, yeah. furry dog that wouldn't do anything, but he yeah. looks tough. Uh, because if any, with the mace, I would have it in my purse, which you brought up a great point having it in the front of your belt because I didn't know I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't educated on how to right. use it or how to store it. And so I'd be like, Oh, excuse me, Mr. Robber. I have, I have to dig into my black hole of a purse, find the mace, get it out, take the cap off, learn how to use it, not squirt myself, squirt you. So mm -hmm. I just, uh, if I was going out in the evening, um, in, yeah. in you know precarious is, neighborhoods, yeah. I would just take my dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's true. It's true. But I love that well, idea of, of, yeah. Yeah, of practicing Bear with mace, it, but also yeah. carrying it in the front. That's really clever. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get to it. The What you should do is slowly walk away, keep your eyes on them, 
uh, make loud noises. So do you like back you up Don't then, or you turn your back? Back up and you know, back up to the side and make loud noises. And are, reduce you, the threat. Do you look at them or do you look Just, away? You look at them. It's not you like do. like gorillas. Gorillas, you never look at. Right. Okay. Little, you know, bears. You you want to watch them. Okay. Now, this is no one to play dead. So if they do charge you and attack you, which God forbid, anybody listens to this podcast, I you know, it's never going to happen. I'm going to manifest that never happening to you. But what they say you should do is then you play dead. Okay. When the bear attacks you, if it's a black bear, they said try to fight it. But if you're losing. Lay on your stomach, cover your, the, you know, because you want to protect your vital organs. Clasp your hands on the back of your neck, protect your neck, and pull up your knees. And at this point, the bear should give up and leave. If it's a grizzly, you do not try to defend yourself. You just do that and lay flat on the ground. You know, and I heard that, like the bear may try to flip you. You just roll with it and flip and stay on your stomach. You know, cover your neck and just, and then you play dead and usually the bear should give up. You know, you're going to be messed up, but at least hopefully not dead. But it's very rare, people. It's so rare. It's just, it's extremely rare. So other than that, you know, just respect them from a distance. Go to Yellowstone, support them, support these organizations. Yeah. You know, people Protect from, your yeah. food. Be smart about your food. Be smart yeah. about hiking. Hike in large yeah. groups. Sing camp songs. Uh, we, we made up some song about hiking in the woods. Off we go. And we just were loud. <laughs> <Don't> the, <get. laughs> yeah. We were just loud the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, and they do, and they want to avoid people. They generally want to avoid people, sure. so they don't uh, they don't seek us out, and they don't see us as a food source. All right, so for us again, check us out on Patreon. You know the links are in the show notes. Instagram, All Creatures Podcast, Facebook, All Creatures Podcast, and if you can remember to leave us an iTunes review, we will love you forever, and thank you for those that have. Yes. We love you. And we're going to be back next week. We've got such an amazing lineup. So many interviews done in the can, already ready to go, and more on the way. Yes, it's really exciting times here at All Creature Podcast. And thank you. You guys are our conservation heroes. You're the ones that motivate me to get up and work on the podcast while my kids are still sleeping and to stay up late on the podcast when my kids finally do go to bed. So uh, keep the encouragement and support coming because that definitely helps ignite my fire and it takes mm -hmm. a village, right? Um, yeah. It takes it does, all it of us, all of us working with our different parts. It's wonderful. If you happen to be a conservation field expert working out in the wild, mm -hmm. that's amazing. I I'm envious. I love that. Keep doing that. But there's a million other roles. And for those of us that aren't able to uh, work out in the wild directly, hands on conservation, there's a lot of, hands-off conservation we can do by just sharing this message and educating people and and trying to get that one person to to learn and fall in love with a species because if you know nature you're more likely to protect it right so share this podcast with friends and family and uh we love you and we thank you yep thank you listen learn share Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.